Hello everyone. I first want to thank Amelia Schumach and Suzanne Corey for their invitation to present this case which illustrates the importance to make sure that the genotype you get is coherent with the phenotype of your patient. We're the French reference diagnostic lab for PCD and we're also a research unit that interested in the pathophysiology of this disease. This 56-year-old male patient was referred by our ENT colleagues, Professor André Coste and Dr. Emily Bequignon. This patient had a sinopulmonary syndrome with bronchiectasis since a very early age. His main complaint was chronic sinusitis and the examination of the nasal cavities showed an edematous mucosa with a very sticky mucus. He had recurrent otitis and otorrhea and partial hearing loss. He had no history of neonatal respiratory distress, no situs inversus, neither heterotaxy. He had no history of immune deficiency or skin disease. So this prompted our colleague to assess the nasal nitric oxide, which was indeed very low. This patient also had fertility issues as his unique son was conceived with the help of in vitro fertilization. For this patient, we performed our NGS panel and the first mutation that drew our attention was a nonsense or stop mutation in CCDC103. This mutation was only in the heterozygous state, so we felt that maybe we missed the other mutation. So we went back to the ciliary investigation of this patient, and as you can see on this movie, the cilia of this patient were uh, motile, they were rigid with a reduced amplitude, but still motile. In addition, on most of the CT section, you can see that both dying arms were, were still attached on the outer doublets. So this was not coherent with CCDC103, which encodes a cytoplasmic protein that is implicated in the assembly of dining arms. So patients with mutations in this gene have almost immotile cilia and show an absence of both dining arms in most of their cilia. So Dr. Estelle Escudier uh, noticed that in a small proportion of cilia, there was a slight disorganization and that the axis of the outer doublets was slightly tilted towards the center. So this was for her evocative of a defect in the nexindinane regulatory complex, which links the outer doublets together. So we went back to the sequencing data, but we failed to identify uh, any mutation in a DRC gene. To go further with the sequencing data, we looked for large deletions or duplications that are sometimes more difficult to detect in NGS panel or exome sequencing data. So we analyzed the sequencing depth and we saw that there was no reads that aligned on exon 8 and exon 9 of the DRC1 gene, which uh, was much more compatible with the phenotype that was shown by this patient. To confirm and better characterize this deletion, we performed long-range PCR and we managed to get the exact breakpoints in intron 7 and intron 9. So this makes a rapid and affordable technique to look for this specific deletion in the relatives uh, of this patient. So in the end, this patient had two molecular defects 
one hemozygous deletion in the RC1 that was responsible for his disease and explained his ciliary defects, and one additional nonsense mutation in CCDC103 that had no consequences. Of note, one of his parents was a heterozygous for the CCDC103 mutation and was also heterozygous for the DRC1 deletion and had no PCD. This illustrates again the absence of degenisms in PCD, at least for those two genes. PCD is a rare disease, but it has a high genetic heterogeneity. In fact, so far, about 50 genes have been implicated in this disorder. So this means that the proportion of healthy carrier in one of those uh, genes is high in the general population. It's even higher than the proportion of healthy carrier for cystic fibrosis. So you always have to go on with the molecular investigations until you find biallelic mutations in a gene that is compatible with the phenotype and the ciliary defects you observed in your patient. Even if you do not have access to specific investigations, such as high-speed video microscopy analysis or transmission electron microscopy ultrastructure analysis, there are simple things that you can check. For example, the existence or not of a situs inversus. We know that patients with mutations in genes encoding for dynein arms have a situs inversus in half of the cases. On the contrary, patients with mutations in gene encoding for central complex, radial spokes, or DSC complements never have a situs anomaly. My last slide will be to thank people from the research lab, the technicians from the diagnostic lab who perform the genetic and serial analysis, our colleague Rana Mitri and Catherine Faucon who perform the electron microscopy analysis, and our colleague from Bruno Louis teams who helped us developing a tool to perform deep analysis of the bit of airway cilia in patients and at last the clinicians and of course ADCP, the French PCD patients support group. Uh, thank you. And uh, I don't know if we have questions arising, maybe in the interest of time, we'll, we'll crack on and uh, go into Debbie's case study and we can reserve the questions till the end. Debbie, okay. introduce yourself and, and go ahead. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to first try sharing my screen and see that that works. Can you hear me, Hannah? Yes. yes. Can everybody see that okay? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for the invitation to talk this afternoon um, at this really interesting meeting. I've been thoroughly enjoying everything that's gone before. Um, and it's been mentioned many times about the complexity of the genetic testing. So today I thought I'd just present one of the genes that gives us all in molecular genetic diagnostic labs a bit of a headache, namely Hyden. So we, um, in the Clinical Genetics and Genomics Laboratory in the Royal Brompton, we perform uh, molecular genetic diagnostics for um, as many as possible inherited respiratory conditions. And um, we do this by a large next generation sequencing targeted panel, a custom panel that um, was developed in our laboratory. And we, sub, um, we target sub panels of genes depending on the indication in the patients. And so for PCD, we have a large respiratory ciliopathy subpanel, and we currently look at the 48 known genes for PCD. The two new, most recently this, um, uh, identified genes are on the next iteration of the panel, so we hope to be able to include those um, in the future. So the case I wanted to present is that of a 15-year-old uh, male patient 
who was diagnosed clinically with the suspicion of PCB very early on, actually at a very early age, with a chronic red cough, bronchiectasis, sinusitis, and developmental delay. Um, routine um, electron microscopy was performed, um, which showed normal ciliary orientation and longitudinal profile. Um, both dynein arms were present, um, but it was noted that there was some absence of the central pair um, components. Um, and immunofluorescence, I think this was at a much earlier stage, obviously, was performed, but showed the presence of dynein H5, GAS8, and RSPH4A. He was referred for molecular genetic testing actually only last year, um, and we um, performed next generation sequencing of the PCB panel, and he appeared to be apparently homozygous for a novel, likely pathogenic, a nonsense variant in Haydn, so predicted to be a loss of function variant. Now, the problem with Haydn is that, as with many of the PCD genes, it's a very large gene with 86 exons, and it was recognized um, in 2012 by Albrecht et al., who published the first mutations in Haydn in PCD already, that it has very high homology to a paralog on a different chromosome, on chromosome 1, and that there's um, very high sequence homology, more than 90%, between this paralog, which is called Hyden 2, on chromosome 1, and Hyden 1, the PCD gene, on chromosome 16, with um, even the exon intron structure completely um, retained and homologous. So um, this creates a real problem for diagnostics because you, if you use targeted next generation sequencing with um, hybridization, targeted hybridization, all the reads that you pick up will map to both Hyden 1 and Hyden 2. And the problem is that you're never quite sure if the variants that you see are actually in Hyden 1 or Hyden 2. So, just to illustrate this a um, bit more clearly, if you're looking, the first thing to do is obviously we have to check if the variants are in the non-homologous region, so in the specific region for Hyden 1, so outside of the region of homology. If they are, then the situation is quite simple, and it's the same for all the other genes that we look at. If there's no variants present, you get the zero allelic balance. If you see a heterozygous variant, you have a 50% or 0.5 allelic balance. And if you have a homozygous variant, then you have a 100% um, allelic balance. However, if you find a variant, so that's the normal situation, and you can distinguish between the um, variants that are in either Hyden 1 or Hyden 2. If, however, you're looking at variants that are within the exons 7 to 83 or 6 to 83 that are in the um, paralogous region, um, if you see a variant, as in the middle here, you don't know, you'll see an allelic balance of 0.5, but you won't know to which gene that variant is actually mapped. And the same, you'll see a homozygous, you'll see an allelic balance of one. But the problem is, and the big question is, is this Hyden 1 or Hyden 2? So what we've done bioinformatically to try and um, alleviate the situation somewhat, although it doesn't solve the problem completely, is that we decided that we would mask bioinformatically Hyden 2. And so that all the sequencing reads that one gets with next generation sequencing actually localize to Hyden 1. And this does reduce the number of Hyden 2 nonspecific reads to some extent. It doesn't solve the problem completely, as I mentioned, but with a few further criteria, such as looking at the allelic balance, the type of variant that's found, and most importantly, an in-house database, which is, accumulates all the variants that we've been detecting when we sequence anyone with the panel, it gives us, we learn to recognize the very common um, Hyden 2 variants, which we can ignore. Um, this is certainly not the whole problem, the whole part of the problem, but we've learned now that because we have then four alleles for each of the variants mapping to Hyden 1, we have to get used to different allelic balances. So now a heterozygous variant in Hyden 1 or Hyden 2, in fact, would only be present at 25%, and a homozygous variant would be present at 
And this is not all particularly relevant to anyone listening here, but it's just to give you an example of how we try to manage these things. And so in this, in our particular patient, we then went on to Sanger sequence um, the variant um, in him and his parents um, to check for it. Um, this is also a problem, obviously, with the higher homology between the genes. It's very difficult to design specific primers for the PCR reactions. But we could see this is just to show the very nice allelic balance that in the patient's parents was very much 25%, and in the patient himself, 50% of the other um, compared to the other sequence, um, the other nucleotides. One still needs further confirmation that we're really dealing with a Hyden 1 variant here. And this is where we turn to our colleagues in the cilia diagnostic service. And one of the characteristic things about patients with Hyden mutations is the movement of the cilia. So the cilia are particularly stiff and they show the circling movement, um, which you hopefully can see in this video. And this is the, a picture of the cilia from our patient and showed this typical circling of Hyden um, um, mutants. So this was a piece of bit of added evidence that the variant that we found in Hyden 1 may well be pathogenic in the cause of his PCD. The next piece of evidence comes from um, electron microscopy, and it's, it was published um, with the original publication by Albrecht et al. that the defects in Hyden mutants um, affect the central pair projection, namely C2B, which is shown on the right-hand side um, of the figure. And this is, however, a very subtle defect and very difficult to detect unless using high-resolution electron microscopy. Um, which we're very fortunate in the Brompton to have in the cilia diagnostic service. So this is just an example of how subtle the defect is. And in this patient, it was, knowing the background, possible to see. But I guess if one had just seen this right at the beginning, one might not have been convinced that this was a hidden defect. The other piece of important information came last year in the publication by Sindrich et al., where they showed that the presence of Hyden of um, SPEF2 is actually, which forms the other um, central pair projection, is actually dependent on the presence of Hyden. And using SPEF2 antibody in immunofluorescence, they could show that if that is that that is absent in patients with absent Hyden. And um, so the um, in our cilia diagnostic group, we then did use the SPEF2 antibody. And this is the immunofluorescence in our patient, showing that there was complete absence of SPEF2 in the patient. So putting all these pieces of evidence together, we were actually able then to confirm the clinical diagnosis in the patient and the cause being um, uh, homozygosity for a pathogenic variant in Hyden. But I thought it, it's a good illustration of just, and this has been mentioned many times today already, how necessary it is to have an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach to PCD diagnostics um, using many different techniques and, and much many, uh, different expertise. Also just to, um, with a bit of caution in the interpretation of hide and missense variants, we have so far not identified any missense variants that we thought are pathogenic, all the variants that we've identified and think are clearly pathogenic or not even likely pathogenic are um, loss of function mutations due to truncating variants or splice variants. Um, and then also just always before anyone begins any diagnostics, just to check whether there are any other regions of homology in the genome um, that um, are highly homologous pseudogenes or the like um, to the gene under investigation. I'm very happy to take questions, but I don't know, Hannah, if you possibly want to do all the questions at the end. Hi, uh, yes. So thank you very much, Debbie. That was brilliant. As a matter of fact, I don't think we have questions right now. Clearly, people need thinking time. <laughs> I'll do the final. Uh, thanks very much. So, yeah, let, let's say questions. I'll just do this final um, case study for everybody. Um, We're, uh, we're at 20 past so, and we were a little bit late starting, so we have a bit of time. So I'm just going to describe uh, for everyone's interest about sort of new biology, uh, something that has been published now, but uh, this is the story of a, a new autosomal dominant form of PCD. 
Um, I would uh, like to thank Debbie uh, and the RBA, the, the Brompton clinical team for the slides that I'm showing and all the clinical information. This is very much uh, Debbie's presentation really that I've hijacked. So um, the first presentation uh, of this case was at the Royal Brompton Hospital. Um, a, a female age six weeks uh, with aqueduct stenosis and, and hydrocephalus. Uh, and a shunt was implanted. Uh, this patient also had recurrent chest infections. Um, bronchiectasis was diagnosed at age three years. Um, testing for other underlying diseases excluded cystic fibrosis and immunodeficiency. So um, PCD was questioned and there are uh, patients uh, that have hydrocephalus. It, it seems to be patients with multiciliogenesis gene defects um, uh, in particular who, who have these. So um, the uh, so that the PCD was tested for um, and at that time the, the patient was being treated by airway clearance and intravenous antibiotics uh, had a stable condition and an FBV of 80%. Um, a sudden uh, severe deterioration at age uh, 15 years uh, when the FEV1 declined uh, from 76 to 54% within one year and the, uh, the CT scan showed um, opacities and, and uh, a great bronchiectasis in the chest. There were also um, bacterial infections, aspergillus uh, and staphylococcus. So what's the cause of the bronchiectasis? Um, PCD screening showed um, uh, nasal nitric oxide of 800, um, beat frequency pretty close to normal, but of a stiff dyskinetic beat pattern. There was um, a normal ultrastructure on, on electron microscopy and immunofluorescent antibody staining for Dianal's radial spokes next and links were normal or slash inconclusive. Um, and electron tomography showed normal next and links, so that was followed up. Uh, the patient had no signs of versus, and crucially, uh, this was really our part, <laughs> uh, genetics showed negative. Uh, we didn't find anything really of interest in this patient in 2014 by gene panel, and thanks to these folks at the Royal Brompton for that data. data. Um, interestingly, in this patient as well, um, as hydrocephalus and respiratory disease, there was hydrosulpinx, which is um, a swollen and damaged fallopian tube. So the patient com complained of severe abdominal pain during admission in uh, 2015. Abdominal MRI showed fluid filled uterus uh, and both fallopian tubes, uh, which are lined uh, with motile cilia. So in 2016, given the negative gene panel, this uh, patient was recruited to the 100,000 Genomes Project. That's a whole genome sequencing project uh, that uh, was conducted in the UK. It's now closed, looking at 100,000 uh, patients uh, and a, a particular component of rare disease. So uh, submitted to the 100,000 Genomes Project and as a non-CF bronchiectasis case. Uh, the patient, along with her uh, father and mother, and that found um, in 21 uh, reports, there were seven unique variants of interest identified, and here they are, uh, in various genes, but by far the top of the list was FOXJ1. So um, FOXJ1, it, it was classified as a tier three or class three VUS variant of uncertain significance, but uh, there's a frame shift variant. Uh, it's heterozygous, crucially. So we are told to look for biallelic variants in PCD patients. It's a recessive disease. You expect the mother and father to, to both uh, give a, a variant or mutation to their child. This is a heterozygous patient. And crucially, the unaffected mother and father did not carry that variant, meaning that that's a de novo variant. So de novo variants in general are vanishingly rare. They're a really unique form of a variation, uh, extremely low incidence and highly suggestive of disease causation. FOXJ1 is also a superb candidate gene. Many people in this audience may know about 
uh, FOXJ1, it's a specific expressed ciliated cells. It's shown to be required for cilia formation by gene depletion in a mouse model. The mouse model is actually lethal. Um, required for left right axis determination, highly expressed in motile ciliated tissues uh, and involved in multi ciliated genesis in the brain ependema. Um, and uh, rather like the multi genesis genes, multicillin and CCNO, MCI, DAS, and CCNO that we know to have mutations causing PCD, OXJ1 is, is involved in ciliogenesis and promoting basal body docking and accident formation. So Fantastic candidate. A single uh, patient with a rare disease. So, um, Debbie was contacted our friend, and as happens to me many times in my career, I'm at Omron's group was there already. Uh, they had three uh, cases of Fox J1 mutations and all de novo. So, uh, a really wonderful collaboration set up with. Uh, and they did lots of uh, very advanced techniques. I'm, I'm just going to show from uh, for the interest of time just a few things. So all the all the cases had bronchiectasis, hydrocephalus. There was uh, our uh, the Brompton case did not have, but one of the German cases had cytosine versus. That's rather distinct from CCNO and multicillin mutations that do not cause cytosine versus. And uh, basically, uh, we see that um, there's a, a sort of normal number of basal bodies, but they're not docking correctly. They're mislocalized. Uh, oh, my, my video may not, it doesn't seem to be moving. But uh, so a reduced number of cilia as well, suggesting ciliogenesis defect. As a matter of fact, our, our patient happened to be quite well ciliated. So there's, there's some variability with FOXJ1 mutations, uh, but what I could show you here is that um, the residual cilia beating is uh, stiff with reduced amplitude. There's variability in the EM, our patient looked quite normal, but the German case has had a sort of variety of microtubular, dynamo, and central pair defects. But they're moving. <laughs> so, um, so the, really the learning from this case, brief case, PCD is not just a recessive disease. Uh, this is an autosomal dominant form uh, it, that has now been published in uh, 2019 in Amdrey uh, but I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention in case people were not aware. So we just need to be mindful that single variants can also cause disease, not only bilingual recessive variants. A gene panel may miss a genetic diagnosis. So why did we miss 2014? Uh, Fox J1 was simply not on our gene panel. We didn't know about it. It wasn't there. Um, all variants so far de novo, uh, so, so interesting genetics and should certainly be included in uh, gene panels, box one uh, It has a slightly different biology, uh, as I mentioned, uh, from MCI, DAS and CCNO, the two known multicellular genes. So this ended the, uh, the diagnostic um, uh, question mark for this patient and, and hopefully for more patients in the future. So I, there's a, an enormous number of people to acknowledge. I could just leave those up uh, and see if anyone has questions. The, the Brompton team and, and the, the Munster team. Thank you very much, Hannah and Deborah, and to Marie who sent her uh, presentation recording. I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, we checked and our chat is uh, working fully. So if there are any questions, we still have time to discuss them. And um, I have a question myself, two questions actually. One is that in, in the example that you saw in the last one, um, it is possible to miss the genetic diagnosis of a case because when you tested, the, the, it was not included uh, in the panel, this specific gene. What would you usually recommend in these cases, especially for patients who have uh, a very strong clinical suspicion or a um, very clear um, positive diagnostic tests besides genetics? What would you do in that case? Well, besides genetics? No, if the genetics come uh, negative, then that could be possibly because uh, we have not, uh, the, the gene is not included in the panel yet. Yes, so so not all 
centers for sure have access to whole exome sequencing and, and certainly not whole genome sequencing. And um, Debbie, I wonder from the clinical point of view, if, 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 what do you do next? <laughs> yeah, what, what, actually what you've just said, Hannah, then either it would go, we're not even doing whole exome sequencing now, but I think we're quite lucky in the UK, whole genome sequencing is going live for clinical diagnostics as well although it's not really available for PCD as such. We think it might be in the future, but that I really think would be the next, to be sure there's no genetic diagnosis in a gene that hasn't been identified yet as a PCD gene, that would be the next genetic possibility, would be a whole genome sequencing yes. analysis. But obviously it then needs all the validation, <laughs> replication, et cetera, before it could be used as a clinical diagnostic result. Agree. Uh, um, Marie, hi. Hi and Colson. Uh, do you want hi. to say something? <laughs> That's one thing you can check is also that the, the panel that you did is able to, to check deletions because yeah. in large genes or, or duplications, which is pretty frequent in the NH5 or the NH11, for deletions, it's usually better to have a, a panel than exome unless you have very high sequencing depth. If, our neg if we get a negative panel, we then go on with ex wall exome, and now we, we're beginning with uh, wall genome sequencing. But if we're really uh, sure of the PCD diagnosis. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Rob Hurst. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, we, how many potential autosomal dominant gene defects may exist in existing and new gene candidates? Mm. Um, I don't know if Deb, Debbie Murray would like to answer. I think it, they are incredibly rare. Um, these cases of hydrocephalus and PCD are incredibly rare. Um, Debbie, I don't know if you want Sorry, to... I didn't, I didn't hear the question, Hannah. What was that? Oh, uh, how it? many more uh, dominant forms of PCD are we going to have? Oh, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there may be some, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And I think Amelia has similar, uh, similar question. Um, okay. We have another question from, from yeah. Nuria Kamat uh, for Debra. For hiding analysis, uh, I understand that this sorting of hiding was done by uh, the bioinformaticians. Or maybe you can tell uh, if there is some sub software for non bioinformaticians so <laughs> you can try. <laughs> Very difficult, yeah, because this is a process that happens in the sequence, in the analysis of the sequence data, so very early on. So I think it is really something that only the, it has to be in your bioinformatics pipeline. But all you can do, if it is a matter of trying to, you present it with a variant and you're trying to see if it's in Hyden 1 or Hyden 2, then it would really be to go into all the databases and be trying to identify if it has been mapped in Hyden one or two previously, but it's it's tricky. It's really tricky and quite complicated. <laughs> we have a next question from Nisreen. We see many patients with hydrocephalus who have recurrent respiratory issues that are mostly attributed to aspiration secondary to swallowing issues. Are there any other symptom signs that should make us think of PCD in those patients, some dysmorphic features or other system involvement? Um, well, I think, uh, so um, I'm not clinical, uh, absolutely, that, that was not my data, but I think uh, in that, in the, in this, the, the hydrocephalus patients that we know about, um, they don't really have dysmorphic features, but they do actually have ciliary defects, so if you can do video, if you can do EM, you, you can actually uh, pick things up. Um, I think these ones were missed because they're quite variable, actually. Uh, they're also really, really rare. Um, but now we know about the, the three genes that we, we know about for these hydrocephalus multiciliogenesis defects. Um, but if we're talking about a center without all these sort of specialized screens, then other features in the hydrocephalus 
cases. I mean, Debbie, I think a lot of the, there was more than one female with this uh, fallopian tube, fluid filled fallopian tube. Yeah. I don't know if, so, but I don't think they are dysmorphic. Right? No, not at all, not at all. Um, but nearly all of them had hydrocephalus as well, the patients with box J1, yeah. 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 So for, for, for Nisrin, maybe if, if you don't have, uh, in those patients, uh, the three genes are pretty small, even if you can't uh, access right away to large panels or exome sequencing, maybe you can try Sanger sequencing for those ones. They are, uh, they are pretty small genes. This is, yeah. They are so specific yeah. to get this hydrocephalus. Uh, Absolutely. Um, and I see Claire Jackson, sorry, I'm taking up, says anti spec 2 the antibody spec 2 really supports the hide-in diagnostics. That's, that's a really good point. Um, Marona, are we kind of close to time? I, had a, look, I, I wanted to highlight a couple of posters for people just relevant to the genetics. I, don't want to um, I think we did very well. We are less than 10 minutes late, so that's fantastic. So I think that since there, are, uh, there is one last question in the chat from Rob, and then maybe you can highlight this uh, before we give uh, um, Amelia the talk to close this down. So Rob asks if we have identified any PCD variants in exomic DNA yet. I'm I'm not sure if I get it. Yes. Uh, well, I think some labs may we perform exome sequencing on a diagnostic basis. So, yes. Sometimes it's easier in many countries, it's easier to access uh, exome sequencing than a very specific and exhaustive uh, panel. So, are ah, you making introns? Ah, yes. Uh, introns, yes, there are introns. So you have the, the planking regions, which, which is pretty in which it's pretty frequent to identify mutations, but you have also deep intronic mutations. And there's a CCDC39 African mutations, which is very frequent in, uh, in, uh, in African patients. So, and probably in some patients, we can think that it's a new gene, but maybe it's not a new gene that's involved. Maybe it's a, a deep intronic mutation. And you can only detect those ones by performing either RNA sequencing on a specific gene or whole genome sequencing. Yeah, yeah I think we think they're, they're probably quite a lot of deep intronic variants that we don't know about yet. Um, because most people are not looking at the non-coding sequence, but they're probably going to come to light um, as things progress. Claire, Sorry, how Hannah, I just realized I didn't show my acknowledgements and thanks slide, but it was also to go to Hannah and Claire and Amelia and all the collaborators who we have. I just realized that I, didn't, I, I stopped sharing too quickly. <laughs> Claire is also asking if anyone has come across familiar Fox J1 cases yet, because they have one father-son family with a mutation. Mm. Mm. No, that, that would be novel. I think, uh, Debbie, that would be... That yeah, would we've got... We've got sorry, Claire, I even forgot about that when Hannah said they all been de novo, because that was actually... We found that case after the publication even, I think. But yes, that's that's the one case we do have. And I can't remember, maybe you know, Claire, how, what the phenotypic features, if any, in the father were. Sorry, I was, I was trying to unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. So uh, we repeated the genetics on dad when we identified it in the son, and they both have the same, and they have the same phenotypic features. We don't know if dad has hydrocephalus, but the son certainly does. Both of them developmentally pretty normal, or well, certainly dad, very normal, son quite young at this point, but seems to be developing not too badly. So um, interesting um, situation. I think, I don't know if Hamut's on the, on the meeting today, but I, I have a feeling he maybe does have some um, familial cases like this, and I think it was discussed on an ERN uh, meeting a little while ago. 
Can I can I take one? Thank you very much. Okay, that's great. Uh, I just want to just uh, with uh, I wanted to because I did promise uh, to just tell people about two ERS posters that are, uh, are really relevant to what we've been talking about. So the importance of the PCD community. Um, Deborah men mentioned collecting a database of hide invariants. So a genetic registries where we really share our patient variant data so we understand better for these incredibly rare events, we really need to generate larger genetic databases with a unified variant nomenclature and classifications according to those rules. So there are two um, e-posters of interest at the ERS meeting. The first one by Rama Mani. I'm so sorry, Rama, I haven't been able to show your data. <laughs> Um, but that's about the first results of the beat PCD, um, uh, first international PCD gene variant database called Ciliomar. And then Johanna Ray is pre presenting on behalf of the, the Earn Lung PCD core study group, um, the first results of um, genetics arising from, I think, about a thousand patients collected into the international PCD registry. So, so please go in and look at those. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, Amelia and Johanna both will present uh, um, uh, this data at the big PCD meeting on the 9th of September also, not only as a poster at the ERS, so we will have the possibility to see more details. Super. And now, uh, since there are no more questions for the last session, I would like to thank you all three and give uh, uh, the chance to Amelia to summarize today's training school. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say, so I've got 16 minutes until this is over. So I'm going to talk for all of that um, and I'm going to use it to clear my name that I have not at any stage in these proceedings muted anybody. Um, and then I'm going to summarise the training school. So um, no, seriously, um, I've learned, um, I think I've learned a huge amount um, today. I uh, always learn something uh, from these meetings. I've been going to the training schools uh, since they started. Um, I think it's been really fantastic. Thank you so much to everyone who has given up their time on a Saturday to do this. Um, thank you to all of the speakers for their fantastic uh, talks um, and to the chairs who have kept us pretty much to time for the sessions. Uh, so thank you for your time.